take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading. Do Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah 7. We're going to read verses 17 through 24. Verses 17 through 24. I'll begin on 17. You join me on 18. And then we'll alternate like that until we end together on verse 24. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please. And I'll begin on 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make their cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast, and upon the trees of the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn, and it shall not be quenched. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings under your sacrifices, and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music tonight and for the great hymns that we've been able to sing and the truth that is in each one of them. Lord, it's been a blessing to sing these songs this evening. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the good spirit that's in this place tonight. And Lord, we would ask you now that you would continue to make our hearts ready, that we could receive the truth from your word. I pray you'll bless the special. Lord, use it in, in each one of our hearts and lives and to tune our heart to your heart. That Lord, we'll all have uh, attention and focus ready to listen to your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. But we never will prove the delights of his love unto all on the altar we lay. For the flavor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. 
Jesus, but to trust and obey. And in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Father in heaven, we bow before you now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the admonition. We just heard that we just trust and obey. And Father, I'm asking now for your help as we bring this message this evening and we look at this truth from Jeremiah chapter 7. That you'd help us to understand what was happening in Israel at the time and Jeremiah's message to the people then. And Lord, help us to apply that to our lives today and what you would want us to learn from this particular passage. So Lord, help me as I bring the message tonight. May it be clear. Help me to say what I ought to say and leave unsaid what I don't need to say. Lord, I pray that you'd use your word again in the heart and lives of your people. May you be honored and may you be pleased with what's said tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. What you have in Jeremiah is the invasion of Babylon down to Jerusalem, uh, Judea, if you will, Judah. And there, there were three invasions, and Jeremiah is the prophet uh, waiting for the final invasion. Uh, Daniel and his group are gone. Uh, there's another group that Ezekiel was a part of, and they're gone. And Jeremiah is the last one, and he is seeing the deterioration of Jerusalem. He's watching as they approach the final days when Babylon will come for the final time and destroy the city and take everyone captive. Um, he's just watching uh, some very disturbing things. He saw men and women go into the temple to attend services and offer sacrifices to God and uh, do sing psalms and all of that. But the problem what the Jeremiah had was not what they were doing in the temple. He was watching what they were doing outside of the temple. He didn't just see what they did when they went to church, so to speak. He saw what they were doing in their everyday lives. And he saw adultery, he saw murder, he saw theft, he saw idolatry, he saw people perjuring themselves in, in courts of law. And Jeremiah, by under the inspiration of God, exploded on him and let him know what he thought. And uh, you understand what was going on was not just in an individual or two. It wasn't just one here or one there. Entire families were involved in this thing. And uh, thus the verse that we use our text tonight in verse number 18. The children were gathering the wood, the fathers kindled the fire, and the women knead their dough and make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. And by the way, in this context, we know the queen of heaven is a false god. And that hasn't changed. There is no biblical queen of heaven. Just in case you're wondering. Uh, there is no such creature. And, and they were trying to uh, provoke God to anger. And you know, uh, I hear people say, and I'm sure these people are thinking, you know what, it's, it's no big deal. I can do what I want as long as I'm not hurting anybody. I can, I can do what I want. I'm not hurting anybody by it. And so here they were being hypocritical, and we'll talk a little more about that as we get into the message. And, and, and the question I started thinking as I read this passage was, well, they don't think they're hurting anyone, but who are they hurting? When you and I don't live the way we ought to live, who do we hurt? Who are we, who are we causing pain to? I heard somebody say, that the first, and by the way, that's right, and they didn't consider that. The first person you hurt is God. You hurt God. You see, uh, thus saith the Lord of hosts, look at verse number, go back up, verse number 9. 
Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord of hosts. God is saying, you're, you're doing all this, you're, you're committing the abominations and committing the idolatries, then coming into my house and saying and thinking it's okay because you're giving sacrifice to me. And God says, don't you think I see this? Do you think I just see what goes on inside the church? Don't you think I see what goes on outside too? And God say, don't you think I'm watching? You know, God hurts. You know what? You know how God feels when his children go astray? He hurts. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel when your children go astray? Some of you in this room have had adult children that have gone astray. And listen, the, the reaction is not anger. It's, 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 it's not malice. It's, not, it's hurt. You're, you're grieved. God is grieved. God is hurt. God loves. God is a person. God has feelings. See, sometimes we, we tend to think that God is just kind of abstract. God is a set of rules. God is uh, do this, don't do that, and, 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 and very impersonal. But you have to understand that Jeremiah... Uh, points out that, and by the way, what people do then is they, they want to substitute religion for God. Because it's impersonal that way. And they don't want that personal relationship with God. And they don't want to have the, the, the feelings involved in that. It's a whole lot easier if you, if you just avoid thinking of God as personal and think of Him as some kind of machine. Grace me, you know, think of Him as the ATM at the bank. You don't talk to a teller. You don't have to interact with anybody. You just talk to the machine. And you just go through and, and pretty soon your banking's pretty, pretty cold and pretty heartless. You just do the transaction and get the money you want or give them the money and, and, and you're done. And, and God is just a, kind of the a, a glorified ATM machine. Hey, but there's thousands of people all across the country that that's how they did church this morning. They walked in and did the mumbo jumbo and, uh, you know, uh, give me your uh, four digit code and uh, recite the things to me and tell me what you want to deposit or what you want to get out. And they said all the right things and then they went home and said, I did my church thing. Just like I went to the bank today. And it's very cold and very impersonal and there's no feeling with God at all. Some people think, I just get baptized, I'll have it made. And, and, I just uh, follow a ritual or, or do something that God wants me to do. I'll, I'll, some people think I dedicated my child to the Lord. That should do it. Uh, that should be something. Can I help you with something? You, you don't really dedicate a child to God. You, you dedicate them to God, but the truth is, mom and dad, you're dedicating yourselves. You're supposed to be dedicating yourselves that you'll bring the child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, it's it's uh, children already gods, whether you admit it or not, or whether you realize it or not. Children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. He gave you that child, and, and, and you're to rear it for His honor and for His glory. We pray that that child will accept the Lord early in early age, and we pray that the Lord will work in his heart, and he'll understand uh, the, the, the meaning of salvation. But, but listen, it, it, it's not religion, it's not rituals, it's not ceremonies that God's looking for. God's looking for a relationship. God's looking for a relationship with you and me. He, 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 he gets hurt when we substitute religious activity for a relationship with Him. There's people all over who are just satisfied with, I went to church, instead of being satisfied with, I know God. I talk to God. God talks to me. I have a relationship with Him. And God says, I'm watching. Notice in verse number 22, what the Lord said. The Lord said, I, <coughs> I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. You see that? God says, you know what? 
I didn't talk to your fathers, and I did not command them when I brought them out of Egypt. What didn't I talk to them about or command them about? Sacrifices and offerings. So I didn't talk to them about that at all. I didn't give any commands. That, those things that you're putting all your stock in and that you're making a big deal out of, I didn't command any of that. I didn't talk to them about any of that. We'll say, well, what does God want? Uh, look at verse number 20, uh, 23. This thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with thee. That's what God was talking about. God was talking about trust and obey. obey. That's the only way to be happy in Jesus, is to trust and obey. So don't, don't, don't substitute a cold and informal religion for a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with God. It's like, it's like uh, uh, you know, eating a piece of cardboard or eating a piece of nice juicy steak. I'll take the steak, my friend. I don't, I don't really care about chewing on cardboard. And, and it's not, not nourishing and not tasty and it's, it's no good. But you know what? Dead religion's the same way. Why would you go through ritual and ceremony and, and, and let that suffice when you can know God? When you can talk to God? When God can talk to you? So I think it's, it's what we sang tonight. It's that, it's that uh, I, I, I sought a flag to follow, a cause for which to stand. I, listen, I, I found for satisfaction, to, for that longing deep inside. How did, how, who satisfied that longing? What is it that filled me up? I found them all in Jesus. He's the life, the truth, the way. He's the one. And so get them all with Christ. So who gets hurt when we don't live for God? First of all, God does. But second of all, some of you said this, we do. It hurts you. We get hurt. When we don't live for God, besides God being hurt, we hurt ourselves. We oftentimes hurt ourselves by what we do. We hurt ourselves by how we live. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And he was grieved about the children of Israel and how they were, li how they were living. God said in verse 18, when he talked about the, I'm sorry, verse 19, he says, Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of, of their own faces or to their own hurt, you could say. They, they're doing it to their own hurt. They're doing it to their own harm. You know, God, God didn't set up the boundaries. He didn't look down at us and say, okay, uh, I, I, I think they enjoy themselves too much. I'm going to take away their enjoyment. Let me, let me uh, uh, put down some rules and guidelines that will make it more miserable for them and some restrictions they're having too much fun. He didn't say that. He didn't say, well, they like money a lot, so I think I'm going to say you better not covet. Or they like money a lot, I'm going to tell them thou shalt not steal. I'm going to put a stop to some of that. Or they really like uh, sexual relations, so I'm going to make sure that I'm going to tell them you're not allowed to be immoral. No fornication, no adultery. I'm going to put the restrictions on them. Or uh, God, God's not saying, listen, God puts the boundaries in in order to protect us from things in this world and from the one in this world who could destroy us and who is out to destroy us. And so you have to understand those are boundaries and the, 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 the joy we have and the freedom we have is within the boundaries. They, Adam and Eve had the boundary of you can eat any tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. And, and they had complete freedom within that boundary. And Satan, uh, listen, when they got violation of that boundary and they ate of the tree, how free were they? Huh, they weren't free at all, were they? They went into bondage. They were driven out of the garden and were not allowed to enter back in. You see, God gives us commandments for our own protection and for our own good. 
I can tell you, hey, you know what? After church tonight, I'm going to get up on the church roof and I'm going to fly off the roof. Yeah, you're glad you came tonight, huh? <laughs> now, for me to do that, I have to break the law of gravity. Okay? And I'll tell you this, what, more, what is most likely to happen is the law of gravity will break me. <laughs> you understand? There's laws in place. What is that there? It's for my protection. So I don't go jumping off the roof with my Superman cape on. By the way, we, we do that. Listen, people do things that ridiculous and then want to blame God. Hmm? It's not God's fault. You hurt yourself. You hurt yourself. Who gets hurt by what we do? We hurt ourselves. When we break God's law, we don't just hurt Him. We provoke ourselves to our own hurt. AIDS or unwanted pregnancies or unexpected hurt feelings, they come and then we get angry at God. We get mad that God brought this or God allowed this or God did this. The truth is, God told you not to do it in the first place. You see, listen, prayer isn't a substitute for disobedience. Sometimes we get folks in the RU program and they're, they're continuing to use or continuing to indulge in their addiction and they say, oh man, pray for me, pray for me. Well, my prayer won't make up for your disobedience. Well, I can pray all I want, but as long as you're disobeying, it's not going to work. It, isn't, it, it is trust and obey. Okay? Obey. Do what God says and then we can, we can pray and get the help of God on your life. Somebody says, I can handle my drugs, or I can handle alcohol, or I can handle gambling. It's all under control. After all, nobody's business what I do with my life. Hmm? But don't be surprised when one morning you wake up to the tragic discovery that you don't have it under control. It has you under control. And then don't blame God for that. Don't put the blame on God. Because that it will become something that controls you, not that you control it. We hurt ourselves. Do they provoke me to anger, said the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? We hurt God. We hurt ourselves. But then I, I want you to notice the third thing in verse 18, and that's our text verse, is when it says, here's what was going on in Jerusalem. The children are gathering wood. The fathers are kindling the fire, and the women are kneading their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, to pour out drink offerings unto other gods. Notice what I think God is wanting us to know here is the entire family was involved in their idolatry. It wasn't just dads. It wasn't just moms. It wasn't just dads and moms. It was dads, moms, children. The whole family was involved in idolatry. They got everyone involved in, in, in false gods, in serving the devil, if you will. And I would submit to you tonight, I think the entire family ought to be serving God. I said, I think the entire family ought to serve God. The devil got the whole family serving him, the whole family in idol worship, the whole family making an offering to a false god. But if we're going to save America, if we're going to have any impact in our country, then we've got to have entire families committed and consecrated to serving Jesus Christ and giving Him everything we have. I mean everybody in the family serving Christ. I mean everybody in the family in church on Sunday morning and on Sunday night and on Wednesday night. And I mean in church, not in the hallway at church, not down in the nursery at church, not in the conference room at church, not in the fellowship hall during church. I mean in church. Singing the songs of God, hearing the preaching of the Word of God. It's a sad thing when my man in the sound room says, i got to close the door because all the noise downstairs, I can't even hear what's going on. During church. Well, listen, my friend, don't be at church, be in church. Be in church and, and be in church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and, and, and live daily as Christ tells us to live in His Word. There's, we're not just coming to church and do the church thing and then we go home and we're somebody completely different. 
Listen, who you are is we're, 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 what manner of persons ought ye to be. This is not something we do. This is who we are. And it's how you live every day of your life. It's time again for families to make Jesus Christ and His work the biggest thing in their life. I grieve at the young families today, and I know the pressure that's coming to young families from the world, and, and it comes from, from the idol of our... Listen, it's, it, it's the idol that our young families face now is a sports idol. And what fills up their Saturdays and their Sundays now are sporting activities for their little ones. And folks are, are, are getting... They're, they're out of church, and, 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 and why? Because they're all at the ball field. And I played sports growing up. I was active in sports. But see, there, and, and this was America, and, 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 and I'm, I, I know I'm old. I'm not that old. But you didn't play on Sunday. That was, that was taboo. They knew Sunday was church day. And, and that, was, that was off limits. And, 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 and just this short amount of time, uh, Sunday's becoming just like another Saturday as far as the sports world goes. You remember when God was going to judge Sodom? He said, should I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm going to do? And you read about it in Genesis 18 and verse 19. He says, I know him. That he will command his children after him to do all that I've commanded him to do. He says, I know that Moses... Hey, listen, Abraham's going to command his children after him. He's not going to command his children, hey, do what God says. You know what Abraham was going to say? Do what I do. Because I'll do what God says. He's setting the example for his family. It's the same as Joshua saying, hey, uh, choose you this day. If you want to serve the gods on the other side of the flood, you go ahead. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua didn't look over at Mrs. Joshua and say, is that okay with you, dear? He says, we are going to serve the Lord. And, and me and my house. He said, we're all going to be serving God. The entire family will live for God. The entire family will serve the Lord. I don't know if you recall. Uh, hold your finger there in Jeremiah. We'll come back to him. Look at Exodus chapter 10 with me, would you please? The book of Exodus. Genesis, then Exodus. Exodus 10. You remember when Moses came before Pharaoh and they were asking him to let my people go. And they were going to go into the wilderness and do sacrifice to him. And Moses, uh, Pharaoh would continue to come up with compromises of what they could do to, to go. And one of the compromises, notice what he said, verse number 7, Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the man go that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, let the, Lord God, let the Lord be so with you as I will let you go. And when your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. For that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh's telling them, hey, if Moses said, we're taking everybody. The young, the old, our sons, our daughters. Everyone's going. The whole family's going. And Pharaoh said, no, just you that are men, you go. And you leave the rest of them behind. And that was not a deal. That was a deal breaker. You know what Moses was saying? I believe you know what God's saying? God's saying, listen, what's good for mom and dad is good for Junior and Missy. What's good for the parents is also good for the children. What I'm saying is, if listen, if it's right for dad to have a haircut, it's right for Junior to have a haircut. If it's right for dad to look like a Christian, it's right for junior to look like a Christian. If it's, if it's right, listen, if preaching's good for adults, preaching's good for children. Preaching good for adults, preaching's good for teenagers. 
Right? If, if the music's right for mom and dad, the same music is right for the teenager. If the music is right for mom and dad, the same music is right in the children's hour. They don't need a different set of music in, than, than what God's people need and what mom and dad need. Dad and mom and, and Missy and Junior and the little ones, they listen, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How great would it be to have some families to say, I'm not going to change just because the world changes. We talked about how, 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 the, how different this world... How many understand? How many of you have seen what a difference this world has been just in your lifetime? Hmm? Haven't you? Yeah? Unbelievable. It's not hard to see. The world isn't where it used to be. You just heard me say, just growing up, oh, just a couple years ago, um, that, that you didn't have uh, sports on Sunday to where now you do. Now you do. All, all over. And, and, and now, that's no big deal. I, I tell you, there are things that go on in churches today. I saw th- uh, some singers at a church online the other day, and, you know, it's just, I, I, I can't believe that's a church. That's, I, I've been in, I grew up in church. I remember when that kind of stuff pre- was preached against. And now, we've welcomed it in. It, it, it boggles my mind. It's, it's, we, we just moved over, and you know what? People just move along. And when we're like the frog in the kettle, and it's just warmed up to it, and we just think it's great. It's a sad thing. I think the whole family ought to serve God. I think the whole family ought to pass out flyers when it's a big day. I think the whole family ought to pass out tracts. I think the whole family ought to serve on a bus route. I think the whole family ought to serve in children's church. I think the whole family ought to be here on Sunday morning. And the whole family ought to come on Sunday night. And the whole family ought to be in church on Wednesday night. I think the whole family ought to pray together. I think the whole family ought to read the Bible. I think the whole family ought to memorize the Bible. Do you know the Bible never says that, that it's just the pastor's job to visit the sick? It's just the pastor's job to make sure that all the prayers get said and the, and the souls got won and the tears are shed and the standards are lifted up and the mourners are comforted. That's for everybody. That's for all of us to do. Everybody gets involved. Now, if, if, if everyone's going to be involved, if the whole family's going to be involved, two things must happen, all right? Number one, we have to be careful in our speech. You have to be careful in our speech. I want to show you something in John 13. The Gospel of John chapter 13. Are you alright? Okay, John 13. Even if you're not, I appreciate you saying you're okay. John 13. And if you get John 13, you might as well pick up James chapter 3, okay? Just stick a finger over in James chapter 3. We'll turn there after we read John. James right after Hebrews. Now notice John 13 and verse number 34 where Jesus says a new commandment I give unto you. Now let me help you with something here. This is not new like no one's ever heard of it before. Okay? This is new like it hasn't been used before. Okay? Um, It's the Old Testament in... uh, Leviticus, I think, it, it mentions you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's Old Testament. So it's not a, to love somebody else can't be a new commandment, but he's saying this is new because it hasn't been used. And I want you to listen. Listen carefully. And God says, here's the new commandment. Jesus says that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And so now we're supposed to love each other. And they say, what's that got to do with being careful in our speech? It means that we better be careful what we say about each other. Did you notice what it didn't say? It didn't say, this is my commandment that you all agree with each other. Aren't you glad? Huh? He didn't say that you all see eye to eye with one another. He didn't say that. And by the way, the apostles didn't. Paul said, I don't suppose I'm every wit behind the chiefest of the apostles. Okay? So it, did, it, it does mean don't criticize one another. It does mean 
Don't talk unkindly about another Christian. Used to say, even unsafe people used to say, if you can't say something nice about someone, what? Don't say anything. Just be quiet. Could we? James 3. Are you James 3? Can you flip over there real quick? James 3 is about our tongue. Notice what he says in verse 8. The tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Did you get that? Bless we God, the Father, and curse we men. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does praise the Lord come out of your mouth on Sunday and then blankety blank, dirty bricka 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 slider rib come out during the week? Do blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth? How are you going to teach your children to not be critical of other Christians or talk badly about other Christians when you don't? When you talk badly about them? The little boy driving with his mom, just three or four years old, and he looks at his mom and he says, Mom, where are all the jerks and the idiots? She goes, what are you talking about? She goes, well, when I drive with Daddy, he tells me all the jerks and idiots that are out there. Yeah? You see, if you're going to teach them to do it, you must do it. You must do it. Guard what we say. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Oh, if we could learn that. Part of loving one another is not being critical to one another. Not talking bad about one another. Don't let blessing and cursing. How do you bless God and talk down someone, talk down another man who's made in the similitude of God? Made in the image of God. Another soul for whom Christ died, another child of God who God loves, how can you talk down? Some of you would have a, if you have more than one child at home and that sister talks about that brother or says something unkind to that brother or that brother says something unkind to his sister. Well, no brother ever says anything unkind to his sister. But if, uh, if, if that, you know what? You would say, hey, you're not going to talk to your brother that way. You're not talking to your sister that way. You would nip that in the bud, as Barney would say. You would stop that. But then they listen to you talk about this person or that person. Boy, that got quiet, didn't it? Hmm? When it gets quiet, you just want to pull over and park a while, you know? Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. Hey, you're going to get everybody involved. You've got to, you've got to guard your speech. Be careful in your speech. You see, the mouth betrays what? Our heart. Uh, the abundance of the mouth, uh, the, the, the heart, the mouth speaks. So it'll show what's in your heart. Okay? Secondly, be faithful in your service. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It means you're going to be faithful. What's faithful? Dependable. What's faithful? Reliable. The same. You know, by the grace of God, we stand exactly where we stood 12 years ago. We believe the same thing we started believing 12 years ago when we pastored Bible Baptist Church. You don't know it. My wife knows it. But I stand the same place I stood 35 years ago. I haven't changed anything. I still believe what I believed then and I still believe it now. You see, because I've learned something, if God's against it, so am I. If God's for it, 
So am I. And, and I found out that God doesn't change. And so if God doesn't change, then what we believe, we'll always believe. See, the, the problem I've got with folks who change and, and who, who don't remain faithful, you have, to, you have to really, you have to answer some questions. You have to ask yourself, well now, was I right back then or was I right now? And, and you know, I, I, we were in a church, oh, several years ago. It was for a family wedding. And um, when we were up in one of the back rooms like this room, there were all stacks of books in there. And we said, man, what's going on? Well, these books, and they were, they were NIV, New International Version Bibles, all stacked up in there. I thought, man, what's going on? Oh, well, we're changing now from the NIV to the ESV. And so they're clearing all those out and going to these. Well, at one point, they cleared out all the King James Bibles and went to the NIV Bible. Now the NIV's out and the ESV's in. Well, how long will they keep the ESV until some new one comes along? Well, now, let's see. Was, which Bible is right? Was it the King James right? Was the NIV right? Was the ESV right? Or is this new one going to be right? Which one's right? They can't all be right. You know? Things, things that are different are not the same. Is that profound? Huh? Faithfully standing for what you believe. Faithfully serving God. Faithfully standing for what's right. And you see what God can do. Do you faithfully serve God? Let me ask you a question. Who excused you from serving God? Who excused you from going soul winning? Who excused you from tithing? Who excused you from being faithful to church? Some of you don't like me very well right now. At Pentecost, they were all with one accord in one place. And you know what happened? The power of God fell. The power of God came upon them and, and they preached the gospel and 3,000 people were saved in one day. An incredible day. The power of God falls on people that love one another, that faithfully serve the Lord with one purpose, stand together, striving for the faith of the gospel, Edifying one another, and God says, I think I'm going to bless that group right there. And He does. This is. You have opportunities to serve. Everybody can do something. Families, get involved. Get your children involved in the missions conference. Get your children involved with helping missionaries. Get a card. Get cards off that table and, and, and lay them down with your children and pray and say, God, uh, provide what we need to get this for the missionary. I remember last year, you know, these kids were so excited to see them open their, their, their things on Saturday night. You know what? They need to be excited about giving and not just receiving. They need to know what it is to give. They need to be involved. I hope. You know, I'd rather be mad at me and say, I don't like him, but I think he's right. I'd rather have you be mad at me, but serve God, than like me and not serve God. I'd like it to be said of us that children serve God, the fathers serve God, the mothers served God. All of them were serving God. All of them doing what we ought to do for Jesus Christ. I read a story about Napoleon, the great conqueror. A criminal was brought before Napoleon to give account for his crimes. As he stood there, Napoleon asked the man his name. And the man said, my name is Napoleon. Napoleon. And Napoleon the conqueror instructed the man to change his name or change his nature. 
said, you have a nature that's unworthy of the name Napoleon. I don't know about you, but we're called Christians. And as Christians, you ought to live up to that name. Amen? Amen. That, isn't, that, isn't what we, that isn't necessarily what we do in here, though it includes what we do in here. That's more so what you do out there. What you do out there. What you do in your neighborhood. What you do when your neighbors are watching. When, when you go to work. When you go to the store. When you go about your daily job. Your daily duties. Let's all serve God. The children. The fathers. And the mothers. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this evening. Lord, I pray that we would get entire families serving you. That serving God and being what you want us to be, doing what you want us to do, trusting and obeying, would, would be that which we revolve our lives around. Because when we trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Remind us, God, that we're never happy with the Bible we know. We're only happy with the Bible we live. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us tonight to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. I sure don't want to be like the folks in Jerusalem who still went to church, sang the songs, performed their sacrifices, did their rituals, did their ceremonies. But when they left the temple, they were idol worshipers. They were thieves. They were immoral. They, they, they were drunkards. They had no regard for the things of God. Lord, help us. Show us that we hurt you when we live that way. We hurt ourselves. Lord, I want our entire family serving God. I know that's what you want. So help us to be careful what we say. Help us to be faithful in what we do. Give us another generation to come up behind us that will faithfully serve you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. We'll have our invitation. wonder how many folks are here tonight and say, Preacher, maybe moms, dads, children. Maybe some children tonight to say, You know what, I, I want to go down the same path mom and dad are going down. I don't, I don't need to go a new way. Don't desire to go a new way. I just want to keep on going down the path mom and dad are going down. I will serve the Lord. Moms and dads who say, We will serve the Lord. Dads who will say, As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Single moms who are here tonight. Maybe you're, you're the one who's going to have to see to it that your children live for God. Maybe tonight God spoke to your heart about being faithfully serving Him. Maybe God spoke to your heart about being careful what you say. Maybe you haven't fulfilled that new commandment to love one another as Christ has loved us. I don't know what area God has dealt with your heart about or what area the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart. But you're here tonight and you'd say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has touched my heart tonight. I appreciate you praying for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pray for me tonight, Pastor? Yes. Yes. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here tonight and God has spoken to your heart, respond to Him. I wonder how many folks here in the room tonight would say, Pastor, if I died tonight, I know for sure that I'd go to heaven. There's a time in my life when I know that I called on Jesus and I asked Him to be my Savior. And if I died tonight and I saw God in heaven, He said, why should I let you into my heaven? I'd be able to say, I've trusted your Son Jesus as my Savior. If that's your case, would you slip your hand up tonight and say, that's my testimony, I know that I'm saved. Would you put your hand up? All right, you may put it down. Here tonight would say, Pastor, I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I can't say that with any certainty. Would you let me pray for you? 
again, will not embarrass you or call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me tonight? Is there somebody like that? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pray. And when I pray, if God has spoken to your heart, respond to Him. When Christians slip out to pray, why don't you slip out from where you are? Come to the front. Let, me, let, let someone take a Bible and show you how you can know God personally through Jesus Christ. Just what God has spoken to your heart about, obey Him. You'll be so glad you did. Heavenly Father, bless this invitation. I thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight and thank you for decisions that have been made in the hearts of people. Now, Lord, I pray you'd seal those decisions at an altar this evening. I pray that folks would bow the knee. And Lord, some, some maybe by the way they live, who have realized tonight they've hurt God. They also maybe realize they've hurt themselves. Others, moms and dads, need to just come and say, we need to pray and say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We're going to be careful what we say. We're going to be faithful in our service. We want God to have our whole family serving Him. It's the only hope we got in our country. So our families to serve God once again. Have your way in this invitation now and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist is going to play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all.
Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for these who have come tonight. Lord, thank you for people whose hearts are tender to you and willing to respond to what you tell them to do. And Lord, we're thankful for decisions that have been made today that will affect us for time and for eternity. It sure has been good to be in the house of the Lord today. Father, we love you. We thank you for each one that's made their way to church tonight. Dismiss us now with your care. Lord, make us mindful you go with us from this place. And I pray that we'll introduce others to you this week. Lord, I pray others will see Christ in us, that we'll be aware of your presence, and that we'll please you in all we do. We love you tonight, Lord. Thank you for a wonderful Lord's Day together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Talking to Mrs. Burns over here, we'll let them talk and uh, get everything settled that she wants to get settled. Amen. That's exciting. That's great. God's doing good things in the Burns household. Amen. That's good. Let's sing together, shall we? I, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, all right? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing. To be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You're listening.